Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear saints, this world in which we live, it is a training ground. It is a gymnasium in which God has placed us that we might exercise ourselves. And the world is a training ground for us in two specific ways. And the first is that simply the sight and the exploration of the creation around us, even the creation of ourselves, should draw our thoughts to the invisible things of God. Basil of Caesarea, preaching about the six days of creation, called the world the schoolhouse where reasonable or rational souls exercise themselves, the training ground where they learn to know God, since by the sight of visible and sensible things the mind is led, as by a hand, to the contemplation of invisible things. For Basil, the sight of the creation in which we live was supposed to lead us to contemplate God's almighty power by which he made all things in heaven and earth, was to lead us to contemplate his design, his intelligence in creating the order that he did, and also then lead us to contemplate his great goodness in that he graciously gave this creation to us and placed us into it for our good. The unbeliever's eyes, though, are still darkened by sin. They're still blinded by Satan. And so they don't look at the world and see God's power, his intelligence, and his goodness towards mankind. Because when you forsake the Creator, you either end up in one ditch of worshiping the creation, or in the opposite ditch of imagining that there is no Creator and that all of this happens spontaneously by chance. But for those whose eyes have been illumined by the light of Christ, the creation, the world in which we live, is a schoolhouse in which we are to exercise ourselves in the appreciation and in the praise of God for what he has created and for this world which he has graciously given to us. That's the first way in which the world is a training ground for us, a gymnasium in which we are to exercise ourselves. But the second way that we are to live in this world, this gymnasium, is that we are to then, in this wicked world, the world that is ruled by the devil, the prince and the power of the air, the world that is steeped in sin, God has placed us in this world that it may be a training ground for us in which we exercise faith towards God and the fruits of faith. St. Paul tells Timothy, exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of this life that is now and that which is to come. Paul's words to Timothy are the Holy Spirit's words to you and to me and to all who bear the name of Christian. The Spirit exhorts us to exercise ourselves in godliness, which is far more profitable than bodily exercise. By bodily exercise, though, we should say Paul doesn't mean going to the gym, lifting weights, and getting your reps in. But the bodily discipline, bodily exercise, is training the body against sin. It consists of things like fasting, which teaches the sinful flesh that it doesn't always get what it wants when it wants it. That's the entire point of fasting, is teaching the sinful flesh to hear and understand the word no. It's a bodily exercise by which the flesh is restrained and disciplined so that the spirit gains more and more mastery over the flesh. That sort of bodily training, that is, in fact, profitable, he says. That is the training that Paul speaks of in today's epistle lesson. He wrote to the Corinthians, I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. The sinful flesh which we all have, the sinful flesh which St. Paul had, it's always trying to get out. It's always wanting to leak out from us so that we perform all sorts of evil deeds and indulge in all sorts of wicked thoughts and words. And if we give it free reign, even just for a moment, it will be fruitful and multiply because sin never stops at its starting point. Paul tells the Corinthians, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? 
run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable one. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Disciplining the mind and the body, that's something that Paul does because he is in a race. He is in a boxing match, and his competitor is very real. It's his own sinful flesh, his body and his mind. He's temperate, therefore, in all things, like an athlete, like an Olympian, using God's gifts in moderation, lest any one of them be an occasion for stumbling and temptation to him. We say mind as well as body because our minds, too, are tainted by sin. That's part of our sinful flesh. And just as many temptations arise simply out of our flesh, so many wicked thoughts, impious thoughts, come forth from our minds as well. And so just as Paul restrains his body, he also restrains his thoughts. He writes to the Corinthians in his second epistle, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself as the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so, this sinful world in which we live, with all of its evil influences, it's a training ground for us. It's a gymnasium by which, in which rather we are to exercise ourselves in disciplining our bodies and our minds, fighting temptations that arise from the flesh and from our, our minds, from within and from without, those of our flesh and those wicked thoughts which hurt and assault the soul. And St. Paul tells us why he does this. Because if he does not do this, if he does not discipline his flesh, then he will disqualify himself from winning the prize, which is eternal life. If he lets the sinful flesh get the upper hand, so that it rules over him, so that it reigns over him, then he will not attain to the prize of eternal life. And he puts before us, for our consideration, the people of ancient Israel at the time of the Exodus. They were baptized into Moses at the Red Sea. They were under God's cloud of presence and protection. They ate not only physical food and drank spiritual drink, or physical drink, but they also ate the same spiritual food and drink which we drink, which is the Word of God. Christ and His Word. Christ, he says, was the rock that followed them from which they drank in the wilderness. But yet, with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now with those words, the epistle lesson for today ends, but Paul keeps going to tell the Corinthians in the next verses just how Israel failed to discipline their bodies and minds. They became idolaters. They committed sexual immorality. They lusted after things that were not theirs. They tempted Christ by claiming that Moses had led them in the wilderness to die because apparently there weren't enough graves in Egypt for them. They complained and griped about God's provision. And so by lusting after evil things, they disqualified themselves from the prize to which they were running, which was the promised land of Canaan. In the training ground of the wilderness, they failed. They disqualified themselves because they allowed their sinful passions to rule in their bodies and in their minds. Lest the same happen to us, St. Paul tells us to discipline our flesh, both body and mind. But such training is more than just something that we do negatively. That is, don't do these things. Resist these things over here. This discipline not only says stop, but it also says go this way instead. It has a positive aspect towards it, or toward, of it. St. Paul tells Timothy in those words that we heard just a moment ago, exercise yourself for godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of life that is now and that which is to come. St. Paul, when he tells us to exercise ourselves in godliness, he is telling us to exercise ourselves in repentance, in faith, and in the fruits of faith. This means that when the sinful thought comes to mind, we cast it out 
and we no longer dwell on it. We instead immediately repent of it. That's the stop aspect of it. This means that if we speak crassly or falsely, we immediately repent of those words, and the same for sinful actions. We repent whenever and as often as the Holy Spirit convicts us by the law, because we know that God has promised to be merciful to the contrite and the broken spirit. Isaiah says in his 55th chapter, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Repenting of our sins, we're then led to the second part of godliness, which is faith confidence in the gospel. Repentance doesn't mean dwelling on the sinful thoughts, words, or deeds and beating ourselves up over them. It means uncovering them before the Lord so that the Lord may graciously cover them with the blood of his Son, which St. John says cleanses us from all sin. The Lord does not, as we chanted a moment ago in the tract, mark our iniquities. He doesn't keep a record of them and a tally of them. Because with him there is forgiveness. And so he casts our sins, as the prophet Isaiah says, behind his back, no longer to look at them. He says, I will pardon your iniquities, and I will remember your sins no more. And then, confidently believing that, that sins are forgiven, and cast and drowned into the depths of the sea of God's mercy, never to be fished out again, in that gospel, he fills us with his Holy Spirit. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we not only confidently believe the gospel, but that we confidently go forth in our lives bearing the fruits of repentance. If repentance and faith, if that's the tree, then the fruits which grow from that tree then are the fruits of faith. Not only the fruits of things like forsaking and abstaining from our sins, but it's also in the exercising of ourselves in godliness, in exercising ourselves in faith towards God, in fervent prayer, in hearing his word. It's exercising ourselves in calling upon him in every need and believing that he will answer. It's exercising ourselves in meditating upon his word. It's also exercising ourselves in good works according to the second table of the law, loving our neighbor, providing for him in every bodily need as we have opportunity, and doing good to all who need so. This gospel, which frees us from the guilt of our sins, which fills us with peace and joy, enables us to exercise ourselves in godliness, in faith, and in love. And so the discipline to which St. Paul calls us today, once again, is one that is both positive and negative. Negative in that we are to fight temptation, that we are to slay it with the sword of the Spirit, as we talked about in Bible study before, that we take and expel every wicked thought and temptation when it arises, but that we positively, confidently believe that those sins are forgiven for Christ's sake. And that in that gospel, not only does the old man daily drown, but the new man daily continually arises to walk before God in righteousness and purity each day. And so, this creation in which we live and move and have our being, it is very much our schoolhouse for contemplating the invisible things of God, as St. Basil told us. But this wicked world in which we live is also our training ground, our gymnasium for exercising ourselves in godliness so that we do not disqualify ourselves by willful and intentional sin, by letting sin reign over us, but so that in our training we may, by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, finish the race, win the match, and in the end receive the prize, the salvation which Christ has won for us and freely promises to us in the gospel. Thus we run, not with uncertainty. Thus we fight, not against a shadow. For we fight each day against our flesh, so that we may, in such godly discipline, in repentance, in faith in Christ's gospel, and in those fruits, take hold of the crown of life, 
which he has promised to us. Amen. May the peace of God, which far surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.